Welcome everybody, this is Alan with Daily Armor of God. Thank you so much for joining me today, I hope you're all doing well. This is reading the Old Testament chronologically in 111 days. This is day 73. Today we'll be reading a mixture of books. We are going to be in 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, and we'll be reading Jonah. So, let's get started here in 2 Chronicles 24. So, um, we read a little bit about Josh yesterday, about how he started uh, to be king when he was seven and he reigned 40 years. So this is Chronicles now. We read Kings yesterday, Second Kings. And if you remember, Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, uh, it's like a recap. But also they add stuff that's not in Kings and vice versa. So there's stuff in Kings that's not in Chronicles. But uh, overall, there's a lot of repeating things. <clears throat> so, continuing on, Second Chronicles 24. First one. Josh was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zebiah of Beersheba, and Josh did that, which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. And Jehoiada took for him two wives, and he begat sons and daughters. And it came to pass after this that Josh was minded to repair the house of the Lord. And he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out unto the cities of Judah and gather all of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year. And see that ye hastened the matter, howbeit the Levites hastened it not. And the king called for Jehoiada the chief, and said unto him, Why hast thou not required of the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection, according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the congregation of Israel, for the tabernacle of witness? For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also the dedicated things of the Lord did they bestow upon Balim. And at the king's commandment they made a chest, and set it without the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring it, bring in to the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. So yeah, we were talking about this yesterday, how God loves a cheerful giver. If you're going to give or do something... Do it out of the goodness of your heart. Don't do it because of, you know, that you feel like you have to or that you're being pressured into it. Do it from the goodness of your heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest officer came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to his place again. Thus did they day by day and gathered money in abundance. And the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them, and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, whereof were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister, and to offer withal, and spoons, and vessels of gold and silver, and they offered burnt offering in the house of the Lord, continuing all the days of Jehoiada. But Jehoiada waxed old, and was full of days when he died, a hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. Now after the death of Jeho Jehoiada came the princes of Judah, and made obeisance to the king, and the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers, and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this, their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah the son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above the people and said to them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper, because ye have forsaken the Lord? He hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. So, yeah, here we see a servant of the Lord, one of many throughout the many years of the reign of kings, a servant of the Lord, prophet, whatever he may be, be uh, speaking up, being God's voice, serving God, and then 
they get killed over and over and over again. It's very sad. So they're doing the right thing, and they're being killed. Um, yeah, it's... It's very frustrating to see that, for sure. But, um, yeah, they so they, they killed them just for speaking the truth. Sound familiar? People throughout the ages getting killed or silenced for speaking the truth, just like Jesus, just like the apostles, just like so many people, so many Christians throughout history being silenced for speaking the truth. And when I say silenced, I mean killed. Thus, Josh the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. And again, it passed. So, okay, so we see here that Josh, this good king, remember it said that he did right in the sight of the Lord? So even though he did right, he still messed up, right? Remember, there's nobody perfect. Remember David. David did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but he messed up. He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. But he did that was right in the sight of the Lord. And then remember Solomon. Solomon, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but he messed up too. And, you know, because of his many wives, he got led astray in his old age and worshipped other false gods, demons. So we see here that, you know, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Um, even though they were good kings and had their heart in the right place, they still messed up at times, just like us. We may have our heart in the right place, but we most definitely mess up at times in our life. So that's just something important to remember. And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Seir came up against him, and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they ex executed judgment against Josh. When they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest and slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the kings. And these are they that conspired against him, Sabad the son of Shemiath, and Ammonitus, and Jehoshaphat the son of Shemrath, and Moabitus. Now concerning his sons, and the greatness of the burdens laid upon him, and the repairing of the house of God, behold, they are written in the story of the book of the kings, and Amaziah his son reigned in his stead. Second Kings, chapter 14. In the second year of Josh, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Josh, king of Judah. He was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoaddan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did according to all the things as Josh his father did. Howbeit the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burnt incense on the high places. And it came to pass, as soon as the kingdom was confirmed in his hand, that he slew his servants, which had slain the king his father. But the children of the murderers he slew not, according unto that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the Lord commanded, saying, the father shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children be put to death for the fathers, but every man shall be put to death for his own sin. He slew of Edom in the valley of Salt ten thousand, and took Selah by war, and called the name of it Jachthiel unto this day. Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. And Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Jews, saying, That thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon, and trode down the thistle. Thou hast indeed smitten Edom, and thine heart hath lift, lifted thee up. Glory of this, and tarry at home. For why shouldst thou meddle in thy hurt, and that thou shouldst fall even thou in Judah with thee? But Amaziah would not hear. Therefore Jehoash king of Israel went up, and he and Amaziah king of Judah looked one another in the face at Beth Shemesh, which belonged to Judah. And Judah was put to the worst before Israel, and they fled every man to their tents. And Jehoash king of Israel took Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Jehoash, the son of Amaziah, at Beth Shemesh, and came to Jerusalem, and brake down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim unto the corner gate, four hundred cubits. And he took all the gold and silver, and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord, and in the treasures of the king's house, and hostages, and returned to Samaria. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoash, which he did in his might, and how he fought with Amaziah king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? 
And Jehoash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. And Jeroboam his son reigned in his stead. And Amaziah, the son of Jehoash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Je Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, fifteen years. And the rest of the acts of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Now they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish and slew him there. And they brought him on horses, and he was buried in Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. And all the people of Judah took Azariah, which was sixteen years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. But he, uh, he built Elath and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Jehosh, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned forty-one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath -hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor left any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord said, Not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Josh. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all he did in his might, how he warred and how he recovered Damascus and Hamath, which belonged to Judah, for Israel, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, even with the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his stead. Second Chronicles 25 Amaziah was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Now it came to pass when the kingdom was established to him that he slew his servants that had killed the king his father. But he slew not the children, but did as it was written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The father shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for their fathers, but every man shall die for his own sins. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made the captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers, throw all the Judah and Benjamin, and he numbered them from twenty years old and above, and found them three hundred thousand choice men, able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. He hired also a hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel for a hundred talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou wilt go, do it, be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. And Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. And Amaziah strengthened himself and led forth his people, and went to the valley of Salt, and smote the children of Seir ten thousand. And other ten thousand left alive did the children of Judah carry a captive, and brought them unto the top of the rock, and cast them down from the top of the rock, that they were all broken in pieces. But the shoulders of the army, which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to the battle, fell upon the cities of Judah, from Samaria even unto Beth Horon, and smote three thousand of them, and took much spoil. Now it came to pass that after Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir, and set them up to be his gods. And bowed down himself before them, and burnt incense before them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? I mean, yeah, think about the insanity of this. This king, Amaziah, he goes to war against the Edomites, the people of Seir. Defeats them, takes all their loot, takes all their gods, their idols, their images, brings them back to Jerusalem, and worships those gods instead of the one true living God, who, I mean, what? <laughs> and this is so true. Like, why do you worship the gods of the people you destroyed who couldn't save the people that you just destroyed? What kind of thinking is this? I don't get it. But he did, and this is supposedly a good king. Remember, it said that Amaziah did that which was right in the, in the sight of the Lord, and then it said, but. Remember, we talked about this yesterday, though. There's always a but, but not with a perfect heart.
So basically, um, I guess you could call him a lukewarm Christian, right? Not necessarily cold, but not necessarily hot or on fire for God, the one true living God. He was just kind of doing his own thing. So, and it came to pass, as he talked with him, that the king said to him, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear, why shouldst thou be smitten? Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee, because thou hast done this, and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Then Amaziah king of Judah took advice, and sent to Josh the son of Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us see one another in the face. And Josh king of Israel sent to Amaziah king of Judah, saying, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar, that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon, and trode down a thistle. Thou sayest, Lo, thou hast smitten the Edomites, and thine heart lifteth thee up to boast. Abide thou at home, why shouldst thou meddle to thine hurt, that thou shouldst fall, even thou and Judah with thee? So yeah, uh, Amaziah is like kind of taunting the king of Israel, and he wants to go up against him because he's feeling like prideful that he, you know, had smitten, wiped out these Edomites. Not all of them, obviously, but a lot of them. And so uh, the king of Israel is saying, why just tarry at home, stay at home? Why should you fall and Judah with thee? And we already know that Judah and him do fall. Remember, they, they go to Jerusalem, they kill all the princes, they take all the spoil out of the house of the Lord and out of all their houses, and they destroy a good chunk of the wall of Jerusalem. We're gonna, I mean, it's just insanity. This is insane. This is supposedly a good king, too. But Amaziah would not hear, for it came of God that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies because they sought after the gods of Edom. Yeah, again, he this king that was a good king, supposedly, was worshipping the little g. Remember, when it says little g gods, it means it's not a god at all because there's only one true living god. Uh, these little g gods are basically devils. He worshipped the enemy he destroyed. The enemies he destroyed, he worshipped their gods, little g gods. Insanity. So Josh the king of Israel went up, and they saw one on the face, both he and Amaziah king of Judah, at Beth Shemesh, which belonged to Judah. And Judah was put to the worst before Israel, and they fled every man to his tent. And Josh the king of Israel took Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Josh, the son of Jehoaz, at Beth Shemesh, and brought him to Jerusalem, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, four hundred cubits. And he took all the gold, and all the silver, and all the vessels that were found in the house of God, with Obadiddam, and the treasures of the king's house, the hostages also, and returned to Samaria. And Amaziah the son of Josh, king of Judah, lived after the death of Josh, the son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, fifteen years. Now the rest of the acts of Amaziah, first and last, behold, are they not written in the book of the kings of Judah in Israel? Now after the time that Amaziah did turn away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent to Lachish after him and slew him there. And they brought him upon horses and buried him with his fathers in the city of Judah. Yeah, so, as you can see, oh, the line of kings in Israel have all been bad. The line of kings in Judah have all, pretty much except for a few, been bad. And even Amaziah, where it said in the beginning that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, he still did so much bad stuff and even died in a bad way as well. Like, man, this just goes, if there's a lesson here, the lesson here so far would be to serve the Lord with all thine heart. And then, you know, the Bible says that the greatest commandment, they ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? They say, and Jesus says, love the Lord with all thine heart, with all thine strength, with all thy might, you know, and the second is like unto it, you know, love your neighbor as thyself. These are the greatest commandments. So loving the Lord with all your might includes, you know, serving him. If you serve him, you love him. If you love him, you'll serve him. So, and we need to be on fire for, for God. Remember the Bible says, God does not want us lukewarm. He doesn't want us cold. He'll, but he doesn't want us lukewarm either. Like, he he wants us either hot or cold, essentially. He even says that, you know, lukewarm, he'll spit us out. Like, it's, it's worse. And if you think about this for a second, here's a good example. Um, when you drink, let's say, tea, a hot cup of tea is nice. I mean, it's the best. 
but also, you know, a cold cup of tea or iced tea is good too. But if you drink like a uh, room temperature tea, well, nasty, isn't it? No, if you add ice though, it's good. But uh, also if you warm it back up, it's even better. So, I mean, that's just, you know, one little visual, but the fact of it remains that God does not want us lukewarm. He wants us on fire. So, very great lessons here to be on fire for the Lord. All right, moving on to Jonah. So, this is chronological. So, this is during the time of Jonah now. Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go in with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Imagine thinking you can go away from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> the Lord is in everything. He's everywhere all at once. Like, you can't go anywhere in this world away from God. God sees all. He sees, you know, during the daylight. He sees during the darkness. He is in everything and around everything. And his presence is everywhere and in everything. So you cannot hide. So, I mean, this is kind of silly that Jonah's like, nah, I'm going to go somewhere where God won't get me. <laughs> Tarshish. Uh, which, you know, oddly enough, that's where Paul's from later on down the line. But anyway. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. And the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said everyone to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, so we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what people art thou? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the, the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was temptuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was temptuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, this is just so amazing. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Think about this for a second. These men on the ship, they didn't worship the Lord God, Yahweh. They didn't worship Yahweh. They worship little G-gods who aren't gods at all, but devils. But here we see in Jonah 1.14, Wherefore they, who's they? The men on the ship, not Jonah, the men on the ship. They cried unto the Lord. This is Yahweh. They, these people who weren't even believers of God, the one true living God, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it, has, as it pleased thee. So, they, so they're like, Lord, please, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to die, but we also don't want this man's blood to be upon us. So they prayed that first, and then they took Jonah up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then, here's, the, here's another great, great part. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Oh my gosh, how amazing is this? Oh, okay, I need to talk about this for a second. Sorry guys, we're going to talk about this for a second. Okay, you know that the fear of the Lord does not mean that they're being afraid. You should know by now. The fear of the Lord that the Bible talks about is not being scared of God. That is not what it means. The fear of the Lord is, I did a Bible study on this, by the way, the fear of the Lord. It's, um, and I go into great detail, but basically it's reverence, respect, honor, and glory, praise, and worship to Almighty God, creator of all things. 
giving the proper reverence and respect to Almighty God. That's what the fear of the Lord is. So these men, once they saw that the sea was calm after throwing Jonah in, they're like, okay, we fear God. We fear the one true living God, the Lord Yahweh. Exceedingly, it says, exceedingly. It doesn't say just that they feared the Lord. No, they feared the Lord exceedingly. So very greatly. <clears throat> And then the next part, which is amazing, and offered a sacrifice unto who? Their gods? No. They didn't offer a sacrifice to their gods. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. That's Yahweh. And made vows. And the last part is just amazing too. Not only did they offer a sacrifice, not only did they fear the Lord, they made vows. These unbelievers, these unbelievers turned to Almighty God because why? Jonah disobeyed God. And here's another point I want to make. That's a very important point. Jonah disobeyed God. Think about this. If Jonah did not disobey God and went to Nineveh straight away, these men would have just went on with their lives, believing in their gods, little g gods, their devils, and never knowing the Lord, never coming to the Lord, potentially never coming to the Lord. Um, but because of Jonah disobeying God, God used the situation. He used Jonah's disobedience for God's glory. Isn't that amazing? Jonah didn't know. No, but God did know. He knew um, and he used the situation for his benefit. So even in Jonah's disobedience, God used the situation for his own glory, which is amazing to think about. Um, <laughs> that even in disobedience, God could use the situation for his glory. Of course he can, because he's God Almighty. He could do anything he wants. But it's just amazing to see. Jonah's disobedience led to men. It doesn't say how many. Um, I'm guessing a lot because the ship, you know, crew and everything, and passengers. Uh, these men came to God because of Jonah's disobedience. And God knew that. Obviously, God knew that. And so he used the occasion for his glory, which is just so amazing. I can't get over this. This is just chapter one, by the way. I can't get over this, how amazing this is. Um, and, you know, that's not the first time that God uses a horrible situation to his, to his benefit. No, he does it all the time. For example, the other thing that sticks with me in my mind is, you know, Paul. Paul being jailed for, for God's, for Christ's sake, when he was, you know, preaching the word of God. And these men of the city, they were jealous because they, they were like uh, silversmiths and they made idols. And they were, you know, afraid that they would lose business because they their business was making, you know, false gods idols. And so they're like, they, they basically complained to the governors or the authorities and had uh, Paul locked up. Paul and Silas, I believe, were locked up in prison. And so it's horrible. You're like, well, why? If, if God chose Paul... Why would God allow Paul to be imprisoned? Because in prison, Paul, remember the jailer? They were singing praises, they were praying, and the jailer heard him, probably other prisoners heard him, and then there was an earthquake during the night, and all the cell doors rattled open, and the jailer, who was responsible for all the prisoners, um, he was about to kill himself, because in those days, if you were a jailer, if you're a guard, and your prisoners escape, you're dead and you're not just dead they torture you and then you're dead and a lot of times they would also kill your family too so the jailer saw all the doors opened and he was about to kill himself and what had happened uh, paul's like don't lay a hand on yourself don't hurt thyself paul says we're all here all the prisoners were still there and so the jailer comes running into the cell and you know is like what must i do to be saved you know, and Paul says, you, you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou and thy household. And the jailer takes him and Silas home and, and their whole household believes and gets baptized. And they have, you know, they eat together. And think about that. If Paul never went to jail, if those men never got jealous and intimidated, and Paul never went to jail uh, in that city, that random jailer would have never been saved. His whole family never would have been saved, never came to, to Christ, never came to God. So God used that horrible situation of, of Paul being jailed for his glory. He brought the jailer 
and his family to him in a horrible situation, just like God used uh, Jonah here. Jonah's disobedience, God used the situation for his benefit and got the, these mariners, the men on the ship, saved, essentially. I mean, look at this verse again. They feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows to the Lord. Hello, basically they got saved. They came to the Lord God and that's because of Jonah's disobedience. So once again, we see just horrible situations being used for good. And this is just two examples. I just gave you two out of many examples. So it's just something to be aware of that God can use any, any situation, good or bad, or both good and bad, to his benefit, to his glory, for his purpose and for his plan. So even in our lives today, a bad situation, God can use. I mean, really think about that for a second. Really reflect upon that. Think about uh, bad situations that happened in your life. Think about a bad situation you're going through right now. God could be using that. Could He can and He will if he, it's His will, but He most definitely can use a bad situation or a horrible situation or a painful situation for His glory, for His benefit. So don't, if you're in going through troubles, which we all will, we all do, we all are, going through something in our lives, uh, just remember that God can and will use that situation for his glory. So it's very important that we realize that um, and keep that fresh in our mind. So, I mean, man, I just love this. Uh, so, yeah, there's so many great lessons in the Old Testament. So when people say that the Old Testament doesn't have anything to learn or to gain, they're dead wrong. There's so many great lessons in the Old Testament. This is just one of many. So, Okay, let's continue on here. But man, this is just so amazing. Like, I read this and I get, like, excited. So the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. This is another amazing verse. Jonah was in such desperation. Can you imagine actually being in the belly of a whale? Like it must he must have felt like any minute now, the whale's gonna swallow me deeper, or I'm gonna run out of air, or you know, I'm gonna run you know, any minute now. He was like in such distress. You can imagine he, him crying out to the Lord. He literally cried. And what happens? The Lord heard him. Of course the Lord hears us in our horrible situations. The Lord heard him. Um, so that's just another amazing thing that we can be assured and have hope in this verse here. We can have hope that we ourselves, no matter which, uh, you know, no matter what kind of belly of hell we're in, so to speak, God hears us. He hears us. Amen to that. So, oh, I love that verse. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, the floods compassed me about, and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped around, about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainteth within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. That uh, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Isn't that interesting too? The, the, the fish did not vomit out Jonah into the sea or, you know, from the depths of the sea, and he'd have to swim up to the surface to get air. No, it says it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't do things, uh, you know, half-hearted. No, God could have easily said, you know, okay, okay, fish. Let him go, and the fish is like deep in the sea, you know. 
and you know Jonah was he could have been let out and it's dark and he had to swim and he had to hold his breath and try to make it to no no on the dry land so that's just amazing Um, another thing here I want to quickly talk about is this. I was sacrificing to thee with the voice of thanksgiving. You know, that's another thing we need to think about. Even during the bad times, we need to give thanks. You know, the Bible says give thanks in all things. Give thanks in all things. It says be instant in prayer. Um, and, you know, in all situations, be give thanksgiving to God. Because there's always something we can, um, you know, thank God for, even in bad situations. No matter what bad situation, there is something in your life you could thank God for and you should be giving him thanks. So it's just something we need to remember, not just be thanking God for the good times or in good times, but also thank God during the bad times. And he has, there is so much we could be thanking him for. Moving on to Jonah 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city at a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. Okay, hang on a second. What do we see again pop up here? What did we talk about yesterday? God is a God of numbers. Look at this. Forty days again. We see forty days pop up. Just like we saw um, yesterday with uh, Josh, the king of Judah, reigning 40 years. Um, and then also three days. We see that pop up again. Three. We also saw that he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Three again. So, yeah, God is a God of numbers. It's just amazing to see the numbers pop up so many times. The same numbers. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way, and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. So we see here that God repented. Now this verse could open up a whole can of worms that I'm not going to get into right now uh, about what repent means. Um, but I will quickly say that God repented, meaning, and in this context, it means a change of mind. Just like um, when it said that he repented, uh, remember Moses in, uh, was trying to save the people because God was so furious with them for making the golden calf and all that, that he wanted to just start over and say, Moses, I'll, I'll just start Israel with you. No, uh, Moses, you know... Uh, you know, sided with the people despite their sin and was like, Lord, please don't destroy them. And the Lord God repented to do the evil unto them that he wanted to do. So what does that mean? It means he changed his mind. Yeah, God can change his mind. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. So in this context, at least, repent means a change of mind. Okay, moving on to Jonah 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Yeah, this is uh, very relatable. If you look up Nineveh and what they did, they were evil. They did so much evil. So, 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 so much evil. And then if you're, if you're Jonah, put yourself in his shoes. Jonah thought that the Lord was going to you know, execute judgment upon such an evil nation, an evil city. And then Jonah's like, what, Lord, you changed your mind? But they're so evil. They're getting away with evil. We can relate to that today, can't we? All these evil in the world, all these evil people, evil corporations, evil governments getting away with anything that they desire, anything and everything. They're getting exactly what they want. They're flourishing. They're getting away with literal murder, 
and so much other disgusting abominations. And it's so easy to get into this mindset where we're, we're like, why, Lord? Why? You know, start doing, going down that line of questioning. It's not up to us to question when God will take vengeance on evil. It's not up to us. It's up to God. And, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The Lord says that in the Bible. Vengeance is mine. So it's not up to us to be like, okay, well, when, Lord? Nor should we be like, Lord, can you do it now? No, it's up to God when, and he will. So that's what we need to keep in mind. He will get his vengeance. Don't you worry about it. We should not worry about it. God will get his vengeance upon all these evil people. So it's just, uh, we need to keep that in mind. So yeah, but Jonah, he has a totally normal human reaction to this. I think a lot of us would have this reaction, especially if you see the evil that they're doing right in front of your face. It'd just be like, you know, just for example, some evil person getting away with murder, getting away with this or that or the other. And um, they're, God's given them a, another chance, you know. It'd be a similar situation. So he was, ex he was uh, displeased exceedingly. He was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Okay, this part he's kind of having a pity party. Um, and he does give, you know, some of the characteristics of God. A gracious God, merciful, slow to anger. And this is all true. We clearly see this throughout the Old Testament. Gracious God, he's merciful, slow to anger, great kindness. And sometimes he does repent of the evil. Remember the flood? The flood? Um, afterwards, he repented. Uh, he said that he would never flood the world like that ever again, destroy everything. So that's him repenting. Again, repenting in this context is changing the mind. He changed his mind of the evil he was going to do to him. Because, why did he do that? He gave these people of Nineveh a chance. He gave them many chances. Remember, he's slow to anger. His mercy endures forever. Great kindness. So he gave them chance after chance. And he saw that these people of Nineveh at the time, um, they were repentant of their uh, evil and they did turn to God however briefly mind you it does get destroyed later uh, so for now anyway they did so then he's having kind of a pity party here's like Lord just just kill me basically then said the Lord doest thou well to be angry so Jonah went out to the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the, of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die. And once again, he says, and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand so, what's a score? Let's go over this one more time. Six score. A score is 20. So, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. So, isn't it interesting? The Lord gave him an example here. He's like, you had pity on the gourd. You didn't labor for it. You didn't make it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And then he says, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city? Because they truly had a change. And God knows our hearts, by the way. This is another thing. God knows all our hearts. We cannot hide anything 
in our heart from God. We can't ever hide anything from God. So for God to spare Nineveh, they truly, at least for a time, they truly changed their ways. Unfortunately, this is where it ends. You know, God, uh, it's left off here with God making it an amazing point. You know, God chose to spare Nineveh at this time anyway. Okay, continuing on to 2 Kings, chapter 15. In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jecolia of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, except, that's what save means, save, which means except, that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the house, judging the people of the land. And the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham his son reigned in his stead. And in the thirty and eighth year of Azariah, king of Judah, did Zechariah the son of Jeroboam reign over Israel in Samaria six months. And of course, you already know that all the kings of Israel were evil. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, who made Israel to sin. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. And the rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. This is the word of the Lord, which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. So it came to pass. Shalom the son of Jabesh began to reign in the nine and thirtieth year of Uzziah, king of Judah. He reigned a full month in Samaria. For Menhanem, the son of Gadi, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria, and smote Shalom the son of Jabesh in Samaria, and slew him, and reigned in his stead. Whew! Man! The rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. Then Menhanem smote Tibshah, and all that were therein, and the coast thereof from Tirzah, because they opened not to him. Therefore he smote it, and all the women therein that were with child, he ripped up. Just wrong. In the nine and thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Judah began Menhanem, the son of Gadi, to reign over Israel, and he reigned ten years in Samaria, and he did that which was evil. In the sight of the Lord he departed not at all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Bet, who made Israel to sin. And Pul the king of Assyria came against the land, and Menhanim gave Pul a thousand pounds of silver, that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. And Menhanim exacted the money of Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth, of each man fifty shekels of silver, to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. And the rest of the acts of Menhanim and all that he did, are they not in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Menhanim slept with his fathers, and Pekai his son reigned in his stead. In the fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekai the son of Menhanim began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned two years. And, of course, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and parted not for the sins of Jeroboam the son of Beth, who made Israel to sin. But Pekah the son of Ramalia, a captain of his, of his, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria. You see all this, like, people conspiring to kill all these evil people, all these evil kings? And you see all the troubles that they're having um, in the land. You know, they're being invaded. Cities are being taken. People are being killed. Why? Hmm. Maybe it has something to do with them not serving the Lord. And all the kings of Israel are evil. Continue on. And the rest of the acts of Pekiah and all that he did, behold, are they, uh, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the two and fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Ramalia, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and reigned twenty years. He did that which is, guess what, evil. In the sight of the Lord, he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, who made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came tiglath Pesler, excuse me, tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, 
and took Ijon and Abel Beth Makkah and Genoa and Kadesh and Hazar and Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. So, here's something else that you have to remember about the kingdom of Israel. That even way before we get down uh, throughout the years until, you know, God carries them all the way captive into a Babylon. You have to remember this, that the kingdoms, uh, the, the king of Israel, or the, the kingdom of Israel, uh, they got bombarded and carried away captive long, 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 long before, you know, the Babylonians come and take away um, the remaining people out of Israel and the remaining people out of Judah. Yeah. So, and this is, you know, this basically the start of it, you know, I mean, it lists all the places that all these people, the, all the land of Naphtali, so all the people within Naphtali, they get carried away captive to Assyria. And Hoshea, the son of Ella, made a conspiracy against Pekah. Oh, what do you know? Another conspiracy. Against Pekah, the son of Ramali, and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. And the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And then his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Here we go. Another but. How be it, which is another word for but, or nevertheless, the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? In those days the Lord began to send against Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia. And Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. So, that's going to be it for today. Man, lots of lessons uh, in today's reading. We see if we... Okay, let's separate it. Jonah is separate from uh, this other stuff. Let's separate it. So we see, you know, the kings of Israel. Why are they getting so much trouble? Why are they so evil? Well, they're getting so much trouble because they're so evil. I mean, if you forgot what these kings did, just go back and read what these kings did. They did horrible abominations. One of them being, they literally put their ch own children through the fire as a sacrifice to Satan. Right? Uh, just to name one out of so many abominations that they did. Um, so, what does that tell you? Not to serve false gods, which are just devils or Satan. Uh, literally, you know, Balim, Baal, Moloch, all these names of gods, false gods. They're not gods at all. It's just another name for Satan. Satan in disguise. That's what Satan does best. He disguises himself. The Bible even says he comes to you as an angel of light. Satan doesn't come to you looking like a devil, red devil with horns and a pitchfork. That's not Satan at all. That's just what the world, uh, you know, conjured up. Satan does not come to you looking like an evil beast or an evil person or an evil... No. He comes to you, the Bible literally says, he is as an angel of light. He's a deceiver. Remember? He has so many names. Murderer. Deceiver. He is a deceiver. So, of course, he's going to pretend to be a god. Pretend to be Moloch. Pretend to be Balin. Pretend to be Baal. Or whatever god it may be. False god. When I say god, I mean little g god. False god. So, he is a deceiver. So, don't have any false gods. Worship the one true living god. The Lord. Yahweh. Capital L-O-R-D. That's Yahweh. Or it's Y-H-W-H. You can pronounce it any way you want. You can pronounce it Yehovah. Or you can pronounce it Yahweh. It doesn't matter. You know, they didn't have consonants back then. So, Y-H-W-H. There's even a theory out there that Y-H-W-H. Um, it's like your breath. Yahweh. You know, take a deep breath in is Yah. And exhaling is Way. Yahweh. I don't know. Just, it doesn't matter. 
doesn't matter how you pronounce it because God knows our intentions. God knows our hearts. I'm not going to get into that argument that lots of Christians get into about, oh, the name of the Lord, it's Lord, no, it's Yahweh, no, it's Yeshua. All right, bottom line, God knows our hearts. We shouldn't be arguing over petty things. Okay, God knows who we're talking about. If you want to say Yahweh, go ahead. If you want to say Yehovah, go ahead. If you want to say the Lord, go ahead. God knows who we are talking about. So, uh, I kind of got sidetracked there. Anyway, the other lesson, like I explained in Jonah, is just truly amazing. No matter what the situation, even a bad situation, even a situation where we're sinful, <laughs> I still love this verse so much. These men, these unbelievers, turned to God because they saw God's great miracle. Can you imagine this, a storm so great that you thought the boat was going to be overturned? Um, that, I mean, it was such a fierce, it said tempestuous storm, exceedingly huge so storm, a raging storm. They th they all thought they were going to die, that the boat was going to get flipped over. And then they threw uh, Jonah overboard and immediately, immediately the sea ceased from her raging. Uh, that's like a huge wake up call, I think. Because that does not happen in real life. I mean, it happened. It was real life. But it does not happen normally. Uh, the sea, a storm, you have to wait for the storm to pass. There's no immediate stopping. Um, yeah, it could pro potentially stop raining immediately. It could. But for the waves to completely cease and everything else to be still and calm instantly is, is not. No, that's supernatural. That's by the hand of God. So, of course, they would fear the Lord. Uh, exceedingly, they would offer sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. So uh, I just love Jonah so much. There's so many lessons to be learned here uh, in the Old Testament. Oh man, every day, every part of the New Testament, or excuse me, the Old Testament, you can learn something new. You can learn something. So the people who say that there's nothing in the Old Testament to be gained or to be learned have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. There's so much in the Old Testament that we can learn, that we can hope in and trust in, and also there's a lot that we can apply to our lives today, in today's world. Not everything, mind you, not everything, but there is a lot, and a lot to be learned. So, amazing verses today, amazing lessons today. Thanks for joining me. I hope you guys have a great evening, morning, noon, wherever you're at. Remember to put God first in everything you do. Have faith in Him. Have trust in Him. Wait upon Him. Have hope in Him. And you'll never be sorry. And God willingly, We'll see you tomorrow with more Bible reading. So, thanks again. Take care and God bless.